Paul the Spanish Sharper by Francisco Quevedo Translated by John Stevens Revised and read by Leon Stevens Book One, Chapter One Gives an account of his birth and country I, sir, was born at Segovia. My father's name was Clement Paul, a native of the same town, God guard him in heaven. He was such as they all say, by trade a barber, though so high-minded that he blushed at being called so, saying he was a shearer of cheeks and tailor of beards. They say he came of a good stock, and according as he drank, it is to be believed. He was married to Aldonza Saturno de Revolio, daughter to Octavio de Revolio Covillo, and grandchild to Lepido Thuracunte. The town suspected that she was not an old Christian, though she strongly urged the names and surnames of her progenitors to prove she descended from those that formed the triumvirate at Rome. She was very handsome and so famous that in her time all the ballad rhymers in Spain made verses of her. She run through many troubles when first married, and long after, for malicious tongues did not stick to say that my father would put in the two of clubs to pull out the ace of diamonds. It was proved upon him that whilst he was lathering the beards of all those he was to trim, raising up their faces for the purification, a brother of mine, seven years of age, quite impunely sucked the marrow from their purses. The little angel died of a whipping he had in the jail. My father was much concerned at the loss, the boy being such as stole with all good will. He was imprisoned for these and other trifles, although from what I am told he came off so honorably that at his first walking abroad he was accompanied by two hundred whales, only none went a-spouting. The ladies, they say, stood at their windows to see him pass by, for my father always made a good figure, either a foot or a horseback. I do not speak it out of vanity, for everybody knows I am not guilty of it. My mother, then, had her share of troubles. One day an old woman that bred me, commending her, said she was of such a taking behavior that she bewitched all she had to do with, but they say she talked something concerning a he-goat, which had liked to have rewarded her with a suit of feathers had she done it in public. It was reported that she soldered cracked maiden heads, revived heads of hair disguising the grey. Some called her a pleasure broker, others a surgeon of dislocated desires, in coarse language downright bawd, for some a go-between, for others no between, and money-catcher for all. You should have seen with what a pleasant smiling countenance she took this from all persons it had made you give God unending thanks. I shall not dally in relating what a penitential life she led. She had her room where only she went in, and sometimes I was admitted, being but a child, all beset with dead men's skulls, which she said were to put her in mind of mortality, though others in spite to her, to put tricks upon the living. Her bed was corded with hangman's halters, and she used to say to me, Do you see these things? I keep them as relics, so that those I have a kindness for be saved. My parents had much bickering about me, each contending to bring me up to their trade. But I, who from my infancy had more gentlemanlike thoughts, never applied myself to neither. My father used to say to me, My child, this business of stealing is no mechanic trade but a liberal art. Then, pausing and fetching a sigh, he went on with folded hands, There is no living in this world without stealing. Why do you think the constable and other officers hate us as they do? Why do they sometimes banish, sometimes whip us at the cart's tail, and at last hang us up like flitches of bacon, although our saint's day has never come round? I cannot refrain from tears. The good old man wept like a child, remembering how often they had flogged him, because they would have no other thieves among them but themselves and their gang. But a sharp wit brings us out of all dangers. In my younger days I plied altogether in the churches, not truth to tell out of Christian zeal. I had long ago ridden the ass had I told tales upon the wooden horse. I never confessed but when our holy mother the church commanded, and with this business and my trade I have made a shift to maintain your mother as decently as I could. You maintain me? answered my mother in a great rage, for she was vexed I would not learn to be a wizard. It was I maintained you. I brought you out of prison by my art, and kept you whilst there with my money. 
If you confess not, was it on account of your own courage? Or the potions I gave you, my good pots did defeat? And were it not for fear I should be heard in the streets, I would tell all the story how I got in at the chimney and brought you out at the rooftop. Her passion was so high that she would not have given over here, had she not, with the blows she gave, broke the string of a rosary, all of dead men's teeth. I placated them, saying I would apply myself resolutely to virtue, and go on in the good way I had proposed, and therefore desired them to put me to school, for nothing was to be done without reading and writing. They approved of what I said, though they both muttered at it a while between them. My mother fell to stringing her dead men's teeth, and my father went away to trim one, so he said, I know not whether his beard or his purse. I was left alone praising God, who had given me such ingenious parents, and so zealous for my advancement. Chapter 2 How I Went to School and What Happened to Me There the next day my primer was bought, and my schoolmaster bespoke, and I went, sir, to school. He received me with a pleasant countenance, telling me I had the looks of a sharp lad and witty. I, therefore, so not to give him the lie, took care to learn my lesson well that morning. My master made me sit next to him, and appointed me a monitor every day, because I came first and went away last, to run on some errands of my mistress, so we called the master's wife and thus I gained all their affections, and they favoured me exceedingly. And so envy grew among the other boys. I kept company with gentlemen's sons above all others, but particularly with a son of Don Alonso Coronel de Zuniga. I used to eat my afternoon's luncheon with him, went to his house to play every holy day, and waited on him every day. The other boys, either because I took no notice of them, or that they thought I aimed too high, were continually giving of me nicknames relating to my father's trade. Some called me Mr. Scrape, others Mr. Suction Cup. One, to excuse his envy, would say he hated me because my mother had sucked two little sisters of his in the night. Another, that my father had been sent for to his house to fright away the vermin, for nothing was safe where he came. One would say, I threw two love apples at his mother when she was carted. Yet with all that gnawing at my heels, they never failed me, praise God. And though I was out of countenance, yet I took no notice, but put all up. Till one day a boy had the impudence to call me son of a whore and witch. Because he spoke it so plain, though I had been glad it had been better wrapped up, I took up a stone and broke his head. Away I went, running to my mother to hide me, telling her all the story to which she said, It was very well done of you, and like yourself, you were only in the wrong that you did not ask him who told him so. Hearing what she said, and having always had aspiring thoughts, I turned to her and said, Mother, all that troubles me is that some of the standers-by told me I had no cause to be disturbed at it, and I did not ask them whether they meant because he was so young that said it. I prayed her to tell me whether I could have given him the lie with a safe conscience, or whether I was begot in a huddle by a great many, or was the true son of my father. She laughed and answered, God of mercy, lad, are you so cunning already? You'll be no fool, you have sense enough. You did right well in breaking his head, for such things are not to be said, though never so true. This struck me to the heart. I resolved as soon as possible to lay hold of all I could and leave my father's house. Shame had overcome me so. I dissembled. My father went and cured the boy. All was made up, and he sent me to school again, where my master received me in an angry manner, till being told the occasion of the quarrel, his passion was assuaged, considering the provocation given me. Don Alonso de Zuniga's son, Don Diego, and I were very great all this while, because he had a natural affection for me. And besides, I used to change tops and gigs with him, if mine were better than his. I gave him anything I had to eat, and never asked for what he had. I bought him pictures, taught him to wrestle, played at leapfrog with him, and was obliging in all respects. So that the young gentleman's parents, observing how fond he was of my company, would pray mine let me stay to dine and sup with him, and most days to stay the night. It happened one day about Christmas, as we were going to school, that a man called Poncio de Aguirre, reputed a convert, coming down the street, little Don Diego said to me, Look you, call him Pontius Pilate and run away. To please my friend I did so, and the man was so affronted at it that he scoured after me as hard as he could with a bared knife in his hand to stab me, so that I was forced to take sanctuary in my master's house. 
crying out with might and main, the man was in after me, and my master defended me, that he might not kill me, promising to whip me, and was as good as his word, though my mistress, in consideration of the great service I did her, interceded for me, it was all in vain. He bid me untruss, and every lash he gave me cried, Will you ever call Pontius Pilate again? I answered, No, sir, and answered him twenty times for so many lashes that he gave me. I was so warned off saying Pontius Pilate, and so affrighted, the next day bidding me say our prayers to the rest according to custom, coming to the credo, pray observe the innocent cunning, instead of saying, he suffered under power of Pontius Pilate, remembering I was never more to name Pilate, I said, he suffered under Pontius de Aguirre. My master burst out a-laughing to hear my simplicity and see how I dreaded the lashing, and embracing me gave me a note under his hand to forgive the first two whippings I should deserve, wherewith I was quite content. To be brief, Twelfth-Tide came, and our master, to divert the boys and make sport, ordered that there should be a king of the cockerels among us. We cast lots for that honour among twelve he had appointed for it, and it fell upon me. I pressed my father and mother to provide me fine clothes. The day came, and abroad I went upon a starved and skinny jade of a horse that more by defect than good manners fell down upon his knees at every step. His back looked like a saw, tail very lean, his neck like a camel's but somewhat longer, one eye crossed and the other blind. As for his age, he had no teeth by which to judge. In fine, he appeared more a weather-vane horse than one of flesh and blood, for with a sickle he had appeared the death of nags. His abstinence showed in his gaunt look, and all this plainly revealed the knavery of his keeper, who made him do penance and fast. Doubtless he had no acquaintance with barley and hay. What made him most ridiculous were the many bald spots on his hide, and with but a lock he had appeared a living coffer. Thus I went swinging from side to side like a jointed baby, and the rest of the boys all tricked up after me till we came into the market-place, the very naming of it scares me, and coming to the herb-seller's stalls, the Lord deliver us from them. My horse snapped up a small cabbage which no sooner touched his teeth but it was down his throat, though by reason of the length of his neck it came not into his belly in a long time after. The herb-woman, impudent like the rest, set up the cry, others flocked about her, and among them scoundrels of the market, and all there fell a-pelting the poor king with enormous carrots, giant turnips, love-apples, and other vegetables considering the enemy's forces were all foot, and therefore I ought not to charge them a horseback, I would have alighted, but my horse received such a shot in the head, that as he went to rear, his strength failing him, we both came down, begging your pardon, into a privy. Your honour may imagine what a condition I was in. By this time my boys had armed themselves with stones, and broke two of their heads. For my part, after my fall into the privy, I was good for little save to repel with stink. The officers coming up seized some herb women and boys, searching them for their weapons, which they took away, for some had drawn daggers they wore for show, and short swords. They came to me, and seeing no weapon about me, because I had taken them off and put them into a house to dry with my hat and cloak, one of them asked me for my arms. I answered in that filthy condition that I had none but what were offensive to the nose alone. I cannot but acquaint your honour, by the by, that when they began to pelt me with the rotten love-apples, turnips, etc., my hat being stuck with feathers, I fancied they mistook me for my mother, and thought they threw at her, as they had done several times before, and this foolish notion being got into my young head, I began to cry out, Good women, though I wear feathers in my cap, I am none of Aldonza Saturno de Raboglio, my mother, as if they could not perceive that by my shape and face. However, the fright I was in may excuse my ignorance, especially considering the misfortune came so suddenly upon me. To return to the officer, he would willingly have carried me to prison, but did not, because he could not find a clean place to lay hold of me, for I was all over mire. Some went one way and some another, and I went directly home from the market-place, martyring the noses of all I met by the way, went in the house, told my mother and father all the story, who were in such a passion to see me covered in filth, that they would have beat me. I laid all the blame on the skeleton jade they had provided me to ride. I tried to give them satisfaction, and finding nothing would appease them, left the house and went away to see my friend Don Diego, 
whom I found in his with a broken head, and his parents fully resolved for this reason that he should go to school no more. There I was informed that my steed, finding himself in distress, summoned up all the strength he had to salute his enemies with his heels, but was so weak that he put out both his hips and lay in the mire expiring. Considering that all the sport was spoiled, the mob alarmed, my parents in a rage, my friend's head broken and my horse dead, I resolved to go no more to school nor to my father's house, but to stay and wait upon Don Diego, or rather to bear him company which his parents were well pleased with, because I offered my friendship to their son. I writ home that I had no need to go to school any longer, for though I could not write very well, for my purpose to be a gentleman, it was more becoming to write an ill hand, and so from that time I renounced the school to save them charges and their house to spare them affliction. I acquainted them where and in what post I was in, and that I should see them no more till they gave me leave. Chapter 3. How I went to a boarding school to wait upon Don Diego Coronel. Don Alonso resolved then to send his son to a boarding school, both to wean him from his tender keeping at home, and at the same time to ease himself of that care. He was informed there was a master of arts in Segovia, one Cabra, that made his business to breed up gentlemen's sons, and thither he sent his, and me to be his companion, and to wait on him. The first Sunday after Lent we were brought into the house of famine, for such penury merits no greater praise. The master was a blowpipe cleric, a long slender cane with a little head upon it, red-haired, so that no more need be said to such as know the proverb, trust neither cat nor dog of that colour. His eyes of occipital residence, as if he had looked out from deep baskets, so sunken and dark they had served for a linen draper's shop, his nose like the Apennines, eaten away with an inundation of cold room, which was not the pox, because it costs money his beard discoloured for fear of the neighbouring mouth which seemed to threaten to eat it for mere hunger most of his teeth were wanting and i think he had banished them for being idle livers his neck as long as a crane's with the gullet sticking out so far as if it had been compelled by necessity to start out for sustenance his arms withered his hands like a bundle of twigs each of them taken downwards looking like a fork or a pair of compasses with two long slender legs he walked leisurely. Whenever he something broke with custom, his bones rattled like a pair of snappers. His voice was weak and hollow, his beard bushy and long, for he never trimmed to save charges, and he said it was so odious to him to feel the barber's hands on his face that he could rather die than endure it. One of the boys always cut his hair. In fair weather he wore a threadbare cap an inch thick in grease and dirt, made of a thing that was once cloth, and lined in scurf and dandruff. His cassock, some said, was miraculous, for no man knew what colour it was of. Some, seeing no sign of hair on it, concluded it was made of frog skins. Others said it was a phantom. Near at hand it looked black, and at a distance bluish. He wore no girdle, cuffs, nor band, so that his long hair and his wretched short cassock made him look like the messenger of death. Each shoe might have served for the tomb of a Philistine. As for his chamber, there was not so much as a cobweb in it. He put spells upon the mice, for fear they should gnaw some scraps of bread he kept. His bed was on the floor, and he always lay on one side, for fear of wearing out the sheets. In short, he was the superlative degree of avarice and the ne plus of want. So into this prodigy's power I fell and lived in his power with Don Diego, and the night we came he showed us our room and made us a short speech, which was no longer out of mere good husbandry. He told us how we were to behave ourselves, and we were employed in this till dinner-time. Thither we went, the masters dined first, and we servants waited." The dining-room was as big as a half-peck, five gentlemen ate in it at one table. I looked about for the cats, and seeing none, asked a servant who was an old stander, and in his leanness bore the mark of the boarding-school, how it came they had none. Tears stood in his eyes, and he said, What do you talk of cats? Pray who told you that cats love penance and mortification? Your fat sides show you are a newcomer. This to me was the beginning of sorrow. But I was worse scared when I observed that all those who were before us in the house looked like awls, and their faces painted with white lead. 
Master Cabra sat down, said grace, and they ate an eternal meal which had neither beginning nor end. They brought the broth in wooden dishes, so clear that Narcissus had been drawn to one of them more than to the pool. I observed how eagerly their scrawny fingers dived down after a poor single pea that was at the bottom. Every sip he gave, Cabra cried, "'By my troth, there is no dainty like boiled meat and broth. Let the world say what it will. All the rest is mere gluttony and extravagancy.' As soon as the words were out of his mouth, he poured the porringer of broth down his gullet, saying, "'This is good for thy health, and sharpens the wit. A curse on thee and thy wit,' thought I, when I saw a servant like a walking ghost, and no more substantial, bring in a dish of meat which looked as if he had picked it off his bones. Among it was one stray turnip, at whose sight the master said, "'What have we turnips to-day? No partridges, in my opinion, in compare to them.' Eat heartily, for I love to see you eat. He gave every one such a wretched bit of mutton that I believe it all stuck to their nails and between their teeth, leaving their bellies excommunicated by association. Cobra looked on and said, Eat heartily, for you are but lads, and it is a pleasure to me to see what good stomachs you have. Pray you do but think, sir, what a sauce this was for them that were pining with hunger. When dinner was over, there remained some scraps of bread on the table, and a few bits of skin and bones in the dish, and the pedant said, Let this be left for the servants. They must dine too. It is not for us to gourmandize all. A vengeance on thee, and may what thou hast eaten choke thee, thought I. What a consternation have you put my guts into. He gave thanks, and said, Now let us give way to the servants, and do you go use some exercise till two of the clock, lest your dinner do you harm. Then I could no longer forbear laughing for my life, but burst out into a loud fit. He was very angry, and bid me learn modesty, ripping up two or three old mouldy sentences, and so went his way. We sat down, and I, seeing such short commons, and hearing my guts roar for provender, being sounder and stronger than the rest, clapped both hands in the dish, as others did, and whipped down two scraps of bread out of three there were left, and one skin. The others began to mutter. At the noise in came Cabra, saying, Eat lovingly together like brethren, since God provides for you. Do not fall out, for there is enough for you all. He returned to sun himself and left us to ourselves. I swear to your honour, there was one of these, his name Sure, a Biscainer, who had so absolutely forgot the way and method of eating, that he put a small bit of crust which fell to his share to his eyes twice, and knew not the third time how to carry it to his mouth. I asked for drink, the rest who had scarce broke their fast, never thinking of it, and they gave me a dish with some water, which I had no sooner laid to my lips, but the spirit-possessed lad I spoke of snatched it away as if it had been a communion basin. I got up from the table in a most sorrowful manner, perceiving I was in a house where they drank to the guts, but would not permit them to pledge. I had occasion to undine, though I had not dined, I mean to ease myself, and asked an old stander for the necessary house, and he answered, I know not, there is no such thing in this house. Ease yourself wherever you can this one time. I have been here two months and never did any such thing, save the day I came, like you now, parting with the supper I had eaten at home the night before. How can I express my trouble and concern? It was such that, considering how little was like to go into my belly, I durst not, though hard-pressed, to let go what was there already. Thus we passed on till night. Don Diego asked me how he should do to persuade his guts that they had dined, for they would not believe it. That was an house of dizzy heads, as others are of surfeits. Supper-time came, for afternoonings were never heard of there. We supped much less, and not mutton, but a little name of Master Goat roasted. Sure the devil could never have contrived worse. It is very wholesome and beneficial, he said, to eat light suppers that the stomach may not be overburthened. And then he quoted a string of hell's physicians. He extolled spare diet, alleging that it prevented uneasy dreams, though he knew that in his house it was impossible to dream of anything but eating. 
Our masters supped, and we all supped, and none supped. We went to bed, and neither Don Diego nor I could sleep one wink all that night, he contriving how to complain to his father, and plead that he remove him, and I advising him to do so, though at last I said to him, Pray, sir, are you sure we are alive? For I have a fancy that we were slain in the battle with the herb women, and are now souls suffering in purgatory, in which case it will be in vain to talk of your father's fetching us away without somebody has our souls prayed out of punishment with a mass at some privileged altar. With this discourse and a little nap we got towards morning, it came time to rise. Six o'clock struck, Cabra called, and we all went to school. My back and loins were swimming in my doublet, and my legs had shrunk sevenfold. My very teeth were already furred, yellow, clothed in desperation. I was ordered to decline some nouns, and was so wonderful hungry that I broke fast with half my words, eating them, and any man will easily believe all this who does but hear what Cabra's man told me, which was that at his first coming he saw two great Flanders geldings brought into the house, and two days after they went out perfect racers, so light they flew through the air, and that he saw leisured mastiff dogs come in, and in less than three hours they went out converted into fleet greyhounds, and that one lent he met with abundance of men, some thrusting their heads, some their feet, and some their whole bodies into the porch, and this continued for a long time, very many people flocking from all parts for that alone, and that he asking what could be the meaning of it, Cabra was so angry to be asked, and he answered that some of those people were troubled with the itch, others with chillblains, all which died of hunger as soon as they came into that house, so that they never bit them no more. And he assured me this was very truth, without that he was guilty of hyperbole. I who was acquainted with the house believe it. I say so, lest what I said should be looked upon as an hyperbole. And to return to the school, he set us our lesson, and we conned it, and so it went in the same course of life I have here delivered, only that he added bacon in the boiling of the pot. Because going abroad one day, he was told I know not what about nobility, and for this reason he provided a small tin case all full of holes like a nutmeg grater, which he opened and put in a bit of bacon that filled it, then shutting the box close, hung it with a string in the pot, that some relish of it might come through the holes, and the bacon remain for the next day. Afterwards he thought this too great an expense, and therefore for the future only dipped the bacon into the pot. It is easy to guess what sort of life we led with the like of this. Don Diego and I were in such a miserable condition that since we could find no relief as to eating, after a month was expired we contrived not to rise so early in the morning, and therefore resolved to pretend we were sick, but dared not say feverish, because we thought that cheat would be easily discovered. Head or toothache were inconsiderable distempers. At last we said we had the gripes, and were very sick for want of going to stool in three days, believing that rather than be at a penny charges for medicine, our master would apply no remedy. But the devil ordered worse than we expected, for Cabra had an old receipt which descended to him by inheritance from his father, who was an apothecary. As soon as he was told our distemper, he prepared a glister, and sending for an old aunt of his, threescore and ten years of age, that served him for a nurse, ordered her to give each of us a potion backwards. They began with Don Diego, the poor wretch shrunk up, and the old woman, instead of giving it him inwardly, let it fly betwixt his shirt and his back up to his very pole, so that became an outward ornament which should have served for a lining within. The young man cried out, in came Cabra, and seeing what had happened, ordered I should be served next, and they would come again to Don Diego. I resisted, but all would not do, for Cabra and others held me whilst the old woman gave it me, but I, to requite her kindness, returned it all into her face. Cabra was all in a rage with me, and said he would turn me out of his house, for he plainly saw it was all a cheat, and I prayed God he raged so that I should be discharged, but I was not so fortunate." We complained to Don Alonso, and Cabra made him believe we did it because we would not mind our book. Thus all our entreaties came to nothing. Our master took the old woman into the house to dress the meat and look after the boarders, turning away his man, because he spied some crumbs of bread on his coat upon a Friday morning. Only God knows how we were plagued with the old woman. She was so deaf that she heard nothing but understood by signs. 
blind and such an everlasting prayer that one day the string of her rosary broke over the pot as it was boiling, and our broth came to table the most sanctified that ever I ate. Some said, These are certainly black Ethiopian peas. Others cried, Peas in mourning? What relation of theirs was dead? It was my master who got a bead stuck, and chewing it broke a tooth. On Fridays the old woman would dress us some eggs, but so full of her reverend gray hairs that they could have claimed the office of governor or lawyer. It was common practice with her to dip the fire shovel into the pot instead of the ladle, and to serve up porringers of broth stuffed with coals. A thousand times I came upon vermin, wood chips, and the herds of flax she used to spin, all which she threw in to fill up and cram the guts. In this misery we continued until the next Lent, at the beginning of which one of our companions fell sick. Cabra, to save charges, delayed sending for a physician till he called for confession more than aught else. Then he called a young quack who felt his pulse and said hunger had been before him and prevented his killing that man. They gave him the sacrament, and seeing it, the dying man, who had not spoken four and twenty hours, cried out, O oh, my Saviour, nothing but the seeing of you in this house could have persuaded me, but it was hell. These words were stamped on our hearts. The poor lad died. We buried him poorly because he was a stranger, and this struck a terror into all of us. The dismal story flew all about the town, and came at last to Don Alonso Coronel's ears, who, having no other son, was undeceived of Cabra's tricks and lies, and began to give more credit to the words of two mere shadows, for we were now reduced to so wretched an estate. He came to take us from the boarding-school, and asked for us, though we stood before him, so that finding us in such a deplorable condition, without more ado giving our pinch-gut master some hard words, he ordered that we be carried away in two chairs, taking leave of our famished companions, who followed us with their eyes and wishes, lamenting and bewailing as those do who remain slaves at our jeer, seeing their companions ransomed by Trinitarians.